Welcome to the ninth installment of AnyCast. This is my podcast where I talk about anything that's going on, primarily with sports, and that we have gotten a lot of, especially now that we've hit the month of August. I feel like it's Christmas Day all over again. Because for the first time since the pandemic, we've had the NBA and the NHL make their triumphant returns. And the MLB over the course of the last week has made their return to go along with the NASCAR that we've had since May. NASCAR, you probably figured out what's going on by now. Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick continue to trade wins back and forth with each other. The latest installment was last week at Kansas when Denny Hamlin was able to pull out a late win over Kevin Harvick and then Brad Keselowski, which had me on my feet because at one point, William Byron, the youngster who replaced, uh, essentially replaced Jeff Gordon in the iconic 24. I know Chase Elliott was there first before Byron, but now Byron's in the 24. And Alex Bowman in the 88 car for my team, Hendrick, both had a chance to win this race. And like the youngsters that they were, didn't quite get the job done. But still, nice top 10 finishes for both. But again, it came down to Hamlin and Harvick. And I think you're starting to sense a pattern with this NASCAR season since we've come back from the pandemic. And no, I'm not talking about Mother Nature because that's been under control as of late. Denny Hamlin and Kevin Harvick have clearly emerged as the two most dominant drivers of the season. And so I think that could be a fun back and forth battle between the two of them. And it could very well come down to those two for the title in Phoenix. Yes, because it's not going to be at Homestead. They changed it up this year, so we're going to be at Phoenix. They've also made some adjustments to the schedule. Seeing as how New York, which, by the way, continues to do a tremendous job of getting their case count under control, but unfortunately there will be no race at Watkins Glen this year. So instead, we're going to try the Daytona Roval. Now, for those who don't know, this is the course that they run at the 24 Hours of Daytona, which takes place back in February, I believe. Or maybe it's July. I get the two mixed up. But in any case, they run that race there. That's going to be an interesting uh, race, mainly because most of these NASCAR Cup Series drivers have not been on that particular portion of the Daytona Speedway before. So... I think that's going to be interesting, especially considering you're not going to have practicing and qualifying because they announced no more of that the rest of the season. So we go to our favorite part of the of how to determine the qualifying order. And and, and by the way, if you're not getting the sarcasm, then then this, this is what I'm talking about. They do a random draw. And by random draw, I mean like they they if you've seen the lottery stuff, They draw balls out, and whichever number shows up, that's the driver's spot for the race. I swear this is a rigged system because Eric Amarola, I am not kidding you, seems like every other week, if not every week, wins that draw and wins the poll. What, does Smithfield had a lot of money, and they're just giving it to to the lottery pickers? It's like, here you go, give Amarola the poll. Because it seems like that's the only way I could think of of him winning the poll every time. Of course, it doesn't matter because he doesn't seem to win every single race. He is in the mix, but you get my point. That defeats the purpose of it being a random draw if that same guy wins the poll every single week, it seems like. And another thing I don't like about it is, is from a Hendrick perspective, they never seem to get good qualifying spots. Although Elliot at least got... Uh, third spot this week for the race at New Hampshire. But I mean, come on. There's ways that you can go about with this. You can determine it based on the point standings. That's the simplest way to do it. Because they use the owner's points to determine the drawing of where you go. 1 to 12, 13 to 24, 25 to 36, and then the bottom four. Just use the point standing. Or another method I heard of, and Brian Keselowski actually is on board with this because he actually replied to this suggestion. Use the fastest lap of the prior race. See, because technically, that's a way to do qualifying without really qualifying. Simple. Tells the story. But I'm not going to get into that too much because it's not really that big of a deal because ultimately, it still comes down to Hamlin and Harvick winning the race. Which is exciting if you happen to like two fierce foes going at each other like they're evenly matched. But let's focus on the other sports because there's a lot that's been going on. The NBA, as I mentioned, and the NHL are both coming back 
They've come back this weekend. Uh, yesterday was the first slate of NHL games since the pandemic. Now, the way that they're doing their rest of their season, they, they're ending the regular season. What they're doing is they're going to allow 24 teams, 12 in each conference, by their points standings at the time that the season halted in March, play their way into the Stanley Cup playoffs. So you're going to have the top four points teams in each conference duke it out in a round robin, meaning that they're all going to play each other once. So you get three games between those teams and determine their seedings that way. And then the other eight teams are going to duke it out in best of five qualifying rounds is what they're calling it. So it, it in a way, it's going to be set up like the seedings for like if there were an NCAA tournament. So you'll have five versus 12, six versus 11, seven versus 10, eight versus nine. And those teams that advance are going to be able to move on and face the four teams that are duking it out for their seedings on the round robin side. The other teams that get eliminated are now in position to get the number one pick in the NHL draft because they too had their draft lottery. I can't even remember. It seems like it's eons ago because of what has unfolded. But bottom line is they did their drawing and you wouldn't believe it. One of the teams that gets eliminated in the qualifying round could win the number one pick in the draft. So you think of it as like a win-win, basically. You win your series, you put yourself in position to contend for Lord Stanley's Cup. You lose, and you could get the number one pick in the draft and further build your team up. That kind of defeats the purpose of the other teams whose seasons have already been over with, don't you think? That's just my opinion. I I mean, a lot of people are going to argue otherwise, but again, I'm not going to get into any details with that, but... From what I saw yesterday, it, it's, for me being an avid hockey fan, a diehard Blues fan, and I'll be happy to see them play again today, but from what I saw yesterday, it felt like hockey was back. Obviously, you're not going to have the fans, and you're going to see the social distancing, but it still felt like regular hockey, and you had intense, tightly competitive games for the most part. Well, at least you had one, and that was the ultimate shocker, was the Canadians pulling one out in overtime against the Penguins, who quite frankly deserved to lose when you botch a penalty shot opportunity. But it's still exciting to see the game back, and so too for the NBA. And again, you're going to see some differences. I mean, no fans, obviously. I mean, players are going to keep their social distancing I've noticed that these games have been high scoring. They're very all-star game-esque like and that there's no defense, which I get it because this is kind of a contact sport and that could easily spread the coronavirus. And I, I understand the worries some there, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this is still exciting to see the NBA return. The MLB has also made their comeback. Now, unlike the NF, uh, NHL and the NBA, which are playing on hub sites, bubble sites, the MLB is playing in their home stadiums. Now, obviously, no fans involved, but you're seeing that they're having an issue. They've been struggling, particularly the Miami Marlins, which is no surprise because Florida is at the epicenter of the pandemic, and they're also dealing with a hurricane uh, that they'll be dealing with this weekend. 20 cases, 20 positive cases for the Miami Marlins caused their whole week to get shut down. Fortunately, no new test from what I last heard, so it sounds like they're going to be back on track to playing this week. But that not only impacted them, it impacted the Phillies, who actually had a couple of staffers test positive, but they came back as false positive, so it looks like things are going to go for Philly. And so that impacted Philly, which impacted the Yankees, who were supposed to play the Phillies, and it also impacted the Orioles, who were supposed to play the Marlins. So the Yankees and the Orioles ended up flexing their schedules to play each other in that gap that they had before they played their opponents. And the and the Phillies are now having to do the same thing. They're going to play the Yankees this upcoming week. They were supposed to play them this last week, but this upcoming week they're going to play them. And it's also impacted the Nationals and the Blue Jays, who, quite frankly, don't want to deal with Florida. I don't think anybody wants to, because Florida continues to struggle to get their case counts under control. But they're not the only ones that have been impacted. The Cardinals also got impacted. Three players and three staff members tested positive. Which for me as a Twins fan worried me because this took place right after the Cardinals played that two-game set at Target Field. 
So that worried me as a Twins fan. As an Indians fan, they probably were worried too. And that's because they're using the same dugout that the Cardinals used for their series against the Twins because the Indians were playing at target field. Thankfully, everything came out okay from the Twins and Indians side of things, so they're still playing their series. In fact, they're wrapping that up today. But the Cardinals had to postpone their whole series with the Brewers, so the Brewers' home opener got delayed by a few days. So now they're going to open that up against the White Sox this week. And the Cardinals are now going to go to Detroit and play four games in three days, and they're going to have to do a doubleheader there. So already there's concerns about the MLB season lasting the whole way. And Manfred has made it clear, we need to get this under control or the season could get shut down. He does not want to shut down the season, but if it comes to it, that's unfortunately the path that we're going to have to deal with. And if you're an NFL fan, you have to worry about this too. You, you, I'm pretty sure NFL fans are going to be paying attention to this because they're going to be following the same playbook as the MLB. They too are going to be playing all their games at their stadiums, not on a hub site. And the difference is the NFL is a contact sport. So that's more, the, more of a chance that coronavirus cases can happen there. So again, that's a lot to watch for over the next few days and we'll see what happens, but... So far, things are not looking good for the MLB. Now, for the games that have been played, can we talk about my twids for a little bit? Six and two record, and the Bomba Squad is back. Tied for the league, league, and home runs. And they've actually got some good pitching to back it up. Brios has come out of the gate okay, but the newly new acquisitions that we got. Kenta Maeda has been rock solid so far. Two starts, 11 scoreless innings, two wins. He's been phenomenal. Homer Bailey looked good in his opener. His start got pushed back. They're going to do a bullpen game today, but he looked good in his debut. And Hill also looked pretty solid in his Twins debut. So that, that's been good, as has the bullpen. Taylor Rogers has looked like a shutdown closer to this point. And if the Twins can have that type of pitching to complement that offense... This is what's going to make them a threat to win the World Series. The other threat in the American League is the Yankees, and they too are mashing the ball. Six and one start for them. They're probably going to coast in the ALEs. And again, this is assuming that the season goes on as planned. They're probably going to run away with the ALEs. Twins, I think, will probably win the Central now because they look really, 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 really good on both sides. Indians, I think, could be a dark horse, mainly because they've got a deep rotation that can keep them in ball games. but their real, only real good pitcher has been Shane Bieber. I tell you what, this, this kid has been unbelievable, and I witnessed that when the Indians beat the Twins the other night. He struck out 27 batters, folks. That's tied for the most strikeouts through the first two starts of the season ever. We're talking since the light ball era in 1901. That's 120 years of live ball baseball, and he tied a record. I mean, that's incredible. I tell you what, this guy is in the early running for the Cy Young Award, and he's going to be the Indians' ace going forward. And they got a really good rotation of starters. I, I tell you what, you got to watch out for the Indians. On the end of side, Dodgers look like they're going to be doing solid the Cubs look like they're going to be the front runners in the NL Central. The Brewers and Cardinals have gotten off to slow starts when they have been playing. So, be interested to see what will happen there. I think right off the bat, you kind of get a feel. And again, you, we can say this because it's a 60-game season, unlike in past years when it's 162. You can clearly see who's going to emerge as World Series contenders. Right now, I put my four teams as the Yankees, Twins, Cubs, and Dodgers. Those look like the four best teams in baseball right now. And and again, there's a lot that can still happen over the course of time, especially if the COVID situation doesn't get under control. But the bottom line is, if we want to get through this season, players need to be like us. We need to wear our mask. We need to keep our social distancing. And no, none of this high five stuff. Air fives are okay. Elbow bumps are okay. Fist bumps are okay. No high fives. And no spitting either. You cannot spit. Besides, most people in regular jobs can't spit, so players shouldn't do that either. I would say make masks mandatory. Because if you could do that, you can at least help keep the coronavirus case under control. Now, I'm not sure what you're going to do with the Marlins and the Rays. Those two teams play at the epicenter of the pandemic, which is in Florida. Uh, that, that's going to be dicey. So 
that will be that will be an ongoing thing for sure. And the MLS is obviously getting close to wrapping up their uh, MLS is back tournament. Also exciting because Minnesota United is in the semifinals. They have looked pretty darn good, and now they're going to face Orlando, who have been the darlings of the tournament, primarily because the tournament is taking place in Orlando. So it's almost like a home tournament for Orlando, but that, that'll be exciting, as well as with Philadelphia and Portland on the other side. Good, good indicator of how these teams are going to build their momentum when the MLS resumes their season. But again, it's nice to see all these sports again because we need to have some kind of diversion. Unfortunately, we've also had some iconic people passing away over the last couple of weeks. John Lewis, who you probably have heard about, read about, he was part of the Selma March. He was with Martin Luther King Jr. He prior to the I Have a Dream speech, he led the way to the changes that we're still dealing with to this day. And he's best known for good trouble, which is not like, I mean, obviously it's like getting in trouble, but doing it for a good cause. And unfortunately, he passed away, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. In this last week, there was a lot of memorials going on. In his tribute, um, I know George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama were at the uh, Ebenezer Church uh, service. Members of Congress were also there. And he even, his casket was taken by a uh, a carrier, a horse rider, a horse carrier, down the bridge that he famously crossed. And many have wondered if that's going to change to his name, and I think it should be. Because he is a role model that a lot of people can follow. And he set the bar, along with Martin Luther King Jr., for what we're still having to fight for today. We want to get rid of this racism. We need to end racism and inequality because we need to treat each other equally. Now, another recognizable icon that unfortunately passed away was Herman Cain. Now, for those of you who don't know Herman Cain... This is how I came to know him, and this is from 2011 when he was running for president at the time. You probably saw this on The Daily Show when Jon Stewart ranted about this, but he used a quote from the Pokemon 2000 movie, and it was a song played at the end of Pokemon 2000, the movie, but it sends a strong, powerful message, and I'm going to play that right now. Very true and powerful message. You and I can make a difference. Life is never easy. Life is always a challenge. Never easy when there's so much on the line. And that fits the situation we're in right now. Life can be a challenge in the fact that we're dealing with a pandemic. It's never easy when there's so much on the line. The healthcare workers should know that because they're putting their lives on the line every day to take care of those who have been dealt with this pandemic and having to deal with coronavirus, which is unfortunately how Herman Cain passed away earlier a few days ago. He was at the Tulsa rally with Donald Trump back in June and has been struggling with the coronavirus ever since. Now, He first tested positive about nine, ten days after that Tulsa rally. So you never know what could have happened between now and then. But we know that he was at the Tulsa rally. We know that it was in a jam-packed arena where there's no way the virus can spread or move out. It's going to spread, 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 spread. And unfortunately, he lost his battle with coronavirus and passed away. But I mention this only because of the quote. While it is from the Pokemon movie, which is the most unlikely source to find an inspirational quote, it makes sense for this time that we're in right now. 
It's never easy when there's so much on the line, but you and I can make a difference. And I say this at every podcast episode that I've done. You can make a difference by wearing a mask, by keeping your social distance, by washing your hands, because you're not only helping yourself, you're helping others around you by preventing the spread of coronavirus. We need to get this under control now, because if we don't, there's the potential for another lockdown, and I don't think anyone wants to go through that again. Businesses could end if we go to another lockdown. People's lives could be ruined if we have another lockdown. You can make sure that we don't get another lockdown by keeping the virus under control, by doing the basics. Wear a mask, wash your hands, keep your social distance. If you do that, you will help yourself and you will make people like Herman Cain, John Lewis, who fought for equality, fought for, fought for all this, fought for a united nation, make it matter. And so for Herman Cain and John Lewis, I leave with this podcast with the quote that Wolf Blitzer uses whenever he finishes paying tribute to those who have passed away. May they rest in peace and may their memories be a blessing.